public session. I just remind members in relation to their mobile phones. Um, and the interference in mobile phones obviously affects sound quality. So again, for our witnesses today, if you could please switch your mobile phone uh, either off uh, or to airplane mode. Uh, I'd like to welcome from the Department of Health, Mr. Colum Desmond, Assistant Secretary, Finance and Evaluation, and from the HSE, Mr. Stephen Mulvalley, Chief Financial Officer. And they are also joined uh, behind them there by Louise Carrigan, who's the Assistant Principal Officer in the Department of Health. Um, so we're meeting, obviously, with uh, representatives of your good selves to receive a briefing on the budget management and control of health expenditure in the context of our committee's work in preparation for Budget 2020. Uh, we have obviously, as a committee, consistently been involved in raising issues in relation to the supplementary health budgets and their impact on the overall budget uh, over the past particularly three years. So I'd like to thank both you, Mr. Desmond and Mr. Mavani, for making yourselves available to the committee today. Before we actually hear from you, uh, can I just do the usual statement that on privilege, uh, which is to provide you by virtue of Section 17.2i, that you're protected by absolute privilege in respect to your evidence to the committee. If you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continues to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded also of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the fact that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So with that privileged statement over, I would again like to thank you for your attendance here today. And I think, Mr Desmond, it's now uh, yourself that I will invite to make your opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome this opportunity to address the Select Committee on the issue of budgetary control and oversight of health expenditure. Uh, the Committee has noted concerns raised by the European Commission, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council and the Parliamentary Budget Office in this regard. For 2019, the Government approved gross expenditure of €17.107 billion Euros for the health sector comprising €16.365 billion Euros for current spend funding and €742 million Euros for capital funding, representing an 11.6% increase on the original vote budget for 2018. This represents an increase of 901 million or 5.8% on the 2018 post supplementary current expenditure budget and 229 million on capital expenditure, showing the government's commitment to providing a health service that seeks to improve the health and well-being of the people of Ireland. The issue of health funding is however a major policy challenge internationally. Despite welcome increases over recent years, the need for effective financial management remains crucial as the health service deals with the larger and older population and more acute service and more acute health and social care requirements, increased demand for new and existing drugs and the rising cost of health technology. The costs associated with these service pressures will increasingly need to be managed, not solely through annual increased exchequer allocations, but also through improved efficiencies, productivity and value from within the funding base in 2019 and beyond. The Sound Care Implementation Strategy was published in August 2018. Budget 2019 included €206 million for specific new initiatives so associated with this launch care implementation strategy, including negotiating a new GP contract, development of mental health services, increased access to hospital services, further rollout of national strategies in the areas of maternity, trauma, cancer and drugs, and a €20 million launch care integration fund. The purpose of the integration fund is to test, learn from and support the implementation of new models of care within the health system. The Commission, in its recommendations for Ireland, highlighted that major reforms of the Irish health system, including the re redesign of our models of care, is central to the successful delivery of a more sustainable and cost-effective health system. The Slaunch Care programme aims to deliver on this over the next 10 years. In relation to budget management and health sector planning, extensive planning and performance management processes are in place. A new HSE board governance structure was established on the 28th of June last with strong competencies across key areas to strengthen the oversight and performance of the HSE pending its further reorganisation and the new CEO of the HSE took up post in mid-May and has committed the executive to a strong focus on, international, on financial performance. The HSE publishes performance profiles on a quarterly basis and separate management data reports for each month. There is a monthly performance management cycle both within the HSE under its performance accountability framework and between the Department of Health and the HSE. 
The HSE's performance and accountability framework operates under a national performance oversight group which has delegated authority from the Director General to scrutinise the performance of the health service provider organisations, in particular hospital groups, community health care organisations, the National Ambulance Service, primary care reimbursement service and other national services to assess performance against the national service plan. In addition, in recognition of the risks arising in relation to health expenditure in recent years, a new health budget oversight group was established this year, incorporating membership from the Department of Health and the HSE and chaired by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. The purpose, of the, group to monitor health the purpose of the group is to monitor health spend and staffing against the current budget allocation and to act as an early warning mechanism for any deviations. The HSE's latest income and expenditure position to the 30th of April 2019 shows a revenue deficit of €116.2 million, Euros, which represents 2.3% of the available budget. The main drivers of the deficit are acute hospitals, PCRS and demand-led schemes, disability services and overseas treatments. Gross voted expenditure in the health sector to June is up 6.8% higher than the same period in 2018, compared to a 5.8% increase on budget, but is 4% below profile. Significant savings are profiled later in the year in line with the target set out in the National Service Plan. Any risk of significant deficit at the end of 2019 is a matter of concern for the Government. However, in general, it is important that the service levels set out within the HSE's National Service Plan are delivered within the allocation notified by the Minister. It is acknowledged that certain issues can arise in year due to costs associated with the decisions outside the HSE, such as increases associated with pay agreements or Labour Court rulings, or policy decisions such as the Government's establishment of an ex gratia scheme in respect of cervical check. The Department is working with the HSE to gain further clarity on the projected end-year position and is working to mitigate any deficit insofar as is possible in cooperation with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. The Minister for Health has emphasised to the Executive the need to address health spending urgently by means of the following measures. Steps to ensure compliance with the staffing limits for 2019, a reporting and monitoring structure around agreed savings targets in the National Service Plan, with responsible managers providing a monthly report from quarter one, a review of the Health Service Executive's performance on, staffing and, on savings and staffing limits, with further interventions as necessary. Despite welcome increases in the health budget over recent years, a financial challenge remains as we deal with a larger and older population, with more acute health and social care requirements, increased demand for new and existing drugs and the rising cost of health technology. The cost of payments under the State Claims Agency are also rising, adding to the overall cost of health above the operational costs funded to meet the health demands of a growing and ageing population. These challenges reinforce the need for good budgetary management and control, a focus on improving the way in which services are organised, delivered and on reducing costs, all of which aim to maximise the ability of the health service to respond to growing needs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Desmond. Now, uh, Mr Mulani, um, we didn't receive an opening statement from yourself, but we did receive a briefing document, obviously. I'm just wondering if you'd like to comment on that in the general position of the budget position of the HSE on your briefing document. Thank you, Chair. I, no, I have no additional opening comments to make. I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, obviously, the Department shared their opening statement with us um, prior to us attending. So okay. that's you're more than welcome. Uh, if with that, then I intend to progress to uh, the deputies who've indicated to me. So the first deputy who had indicated to me today was uh, Deputy O'Brien. And uh, so you are. Can I first of all ask about, and I asked last week in relation to the. HSE capital plan. Um, has it been published? And if not, when are we expecting it to be published? There's work actively underway to finalise the capital plan at this point in time, in line with the general discussion at the Public Accounts Committee in the last week or so, and that is in progress at the moment. Are we likely to get it published before Thursday? The uh, DG of the HSE has given a commitment to endeavour as much as possible to do so. At the moment there is uh, significant work underway in finalising the plan. At this point I couldn't say further than that, Deputy, other than I note the, the um, time frame that was given at the previous committee. What's the hold up? Essentially, Deputy, um, the um, capital plan um, ha has uh, to deal with a very significant level of capital demands on the Exchequer and at this point the um, 
total health capital allocation as set out in the development plan for 2019, roughly 742 million, has to be allocated across all of the competing demands. Um, in addition, additional funding was also provided for the new children's hospital, and a number of these uh, funding issues uh, require significant consideration by the HSE in finalising its capital plan. I can say that it is actively under consideration at the moment. Okay, so it has nothing to do with the overrun? Uh, in relation to, no, the capital allocation is 742 million for 2019. Um, clearly, um, the um, Children's Hospital did require additional funding. The government came forward with additional funding, but it certainly would uh, be a factor in us finalising the plan, but that is underway at this point in time. Because here's, here's where I'm a little confused. I mean, there was a draft plan in February, wasn't there? And that was, on, that was actually being discussed. And then we had the situation where there was 99 million had to be cut from capital budget, um, not all of it from health, uh, but there was a, a portion of it from health. Um, and it was my understanding that that was what was holding up the publication of the capital plan, and it was a case of what projects would have to be or could be delayed. Uh, I'm not saying scrapped or anything like that, but. I'm finding it hard to believe that we're into July, the second half of the year, and we still haven't seen the capital plan. I mean, even from a budgetary point of view, it's crazy. I mean, we're in recess on Thursday, um, and the next time we're going to get an opportunity as a committee to look at it is the 11th of September, which is a couple of weeks before the budget for next year. No, I noted the uh, position given by the Deputy the Director General at the PAC, and uh, it is our intention to progress the capital plan as much as we can, as quickly as possible. It's actively being finalised at the moment, and we are working on the basis of the allocation available to us. We also have the assistance of the summary economic statement published recently by the Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform, which provides an expenditure reserve uh, to cover significant additional uh, spending required both in, in two major areas, one of which is the Children's Hospital, the other the National Broadband yeah, that Plan. Was, that, was, that was 200 million, yeah? And that provides significant clarity and assistance to us, and that was very recently published. So work on finalising the capital plan is underway in that context. So when, when that was announced in the summer economic statement, the additional 200 cushion buffer, did that cause you to go back then and reconsider again? It provided clarity which was very welcome in relation to the costs, the additional costs arising around the children's hospital, for example, which is a factor in the capital plan. Okay. On the children's hospital, there's a clause in the contract, the tender inflation clause, uh, and I believe the first review of that is due in August of this year. Um, I don't know if you can comment on that or if you're aware of that, but it's my belief it's in the first, it's in August of this year, and it's based on um, a 4% threshold for contractors. Now, we're running way above 4% at the moment, um, which means contractors can now come back and look for additional uh, funding from, I presume, from the hospital board, who in turn will have to go back to the Department of Health. Do we have any idea of what the likely figure is going to be if the contractors do come back. At this point in time, I don't have that figure available to me, Deputy. We're working on the basis of the existing situation in trying to finalise the capital plan based on the uh, most recent announcements around funding for that. Do we know what the inflation rate is at the moment? Various figures have been mentioned. Uh, there would be more expertise in relation to that available than I would perhaps have, but certainly it would be above 4%, I would imagine. Uh, if a review has been carried out by the um, Children's Hospital, the Development Board, then we would be strongly in favour of that being finalised as, as early as possible to give as much clarity in the matter. Okay, because it could be potentially as high as 10% in the Dublin area, the uh, inflation rate. And if it is 10%, that's an additional 100 million contractors can come back looking for in August. Will that, will that have to come out of the 200 million which was set aside, or is, that, is it a different pot of money that that will come out of? 
I think when the GMP process was completed, it did identify costs that were accepted as part of that process last December. That led to the announcements and the provision for 2019. You mentioned the 99 million at the beginning. The task now is to firm up on the position for 2020-21, bearing in mind that the capital plan is a multi-annual plan. This is the challenge continuously to try and accommodate programme projects, which when they commence, do have implications for year two and year three and beyond. That always makes it more difficult for finalising the capital plan. I think, uh, subject to recollection, that it was clarified that the GMP process covered certain areas and there were other costs that would emerge. So your information in relation to the examination of construction inflation would be within that latter group, I would imagine, Deputy. Okay, but we don't know what figure I don't have that, that figure potentially is going. And how soon will we know that figure, do you think? That would be a matter for the development board um, to finalise that with the contractor. I mean, is it likely we're going to know before budget there? Because obviously it would have an impact. Well, it would. I agree with you, and I would be surprised if we didn't have an indication. If the, if the time frame, and I'm aware of the time frame you mentioned there, would certainly require significant clarity as quickly as possible on those figures. I agree okay. with you. Just in, in relation to where we are today. <coughs> How far in a hole are we at the moment? Well, the, um, the figures are as given in the opening statement. Um, the, at this point in time, there are certain pressures emerging um, in relation to spending in the executive, um, which are a matter of concern for the government. Um, and as outlined recently at the Public Accounts Committee, the uh, HSC is committed to addressing those pressures um, and is, is working actively to do so within the framework of the budgetary oversight process that I mentioned to you. Um, we are anticipating significant savings which are profiled for later in the year, um, but on present trends taking account of the pressure in certain areas, the HSC would have a deficit at the end of 2019, so it is a matter of concern for the government. How much? We have no particular figure um, but surely to you're us. projecting out. We have um, a view that there are deficit drivers at the moment in acute hospitals, for example, in PCRS and the demand-led schemes, also in disability services and in the treatment abroad schemes. So therefore, there are pressures in those areas and we are able to identify them to this point in time. Certainly, we would do scenario planning with our colleagues in the HSE, but at this point in time, on present trends, we do see the risk of a deficit. Um, but that is a matter of concern for the Minister and for the Government, and we are working actively to manage the process okay. with our what, colleagues. What, what kind of work are you doing? Well, the Budgetary Oversight Group was established by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, which chair it. Both the Department and the HSE are represented and meets monthly and actively to manage the process of trends in expenditure during the okay. year to date. But if we're looking, if we're trending towards a deficit, right? Obviously, savings have to be found somewhere to prevent that deficit. Some, can the HSE outline, or maybe the department or board, we can outline what areas are you looking at to try and get those savings? By way of introduction, they are in the service plan. So, so definitely, if I, if I can assist. So at the end of uh, April, on what we call the operations areas, so the disability community services, acute hospitals, so that covers about 12 billion. Of okay. the overall 16 billion, we're about 18 million over. So that's the area that's most inside our control. It is a minimal to management control. Um, so the savings measures we're targeting there are A, we're looking to live within the affordable level of staffing. And you've already announced some of those savings, haven't you? We have, Deputy. So I mean, the rehabilitative training is being scrapped. Aware of that, I haven't heard that as a specific measure, but if I could just, just answer the question. So, we set out under about 48 headings and three main categories in the service plan at a much greater level of detail mm -hmm. how we were either going to try to reduce costs or limit cost growth, or we had some technical areas. So, in order to try and bring back that 80 million on the, the operational services, what we have to do is grow the headcount but grow it within the affordable levels, manage agency and overtime down as much as we can and then operate within budget and in some cases that means not being able to respond to demand or it means looking for efficiencies um, which don't have any impact on, on activity. And the final question, Chair, if I can. What impact does that have on the patients? Well, what we're focusing on doing, Deputy, is... I mean, are, are any services being cut? 
we, we, we would not use the word cut. We would say we're operating to budget. Now, how that's experienced by an individual okay. is, is a different thing. But what we're saying is there is more money going into our services this year than last year. There is more money going into home health and into disability services. Mm -hmm. Can we respond to the full demand? No. What we're trying to do is make best use of the resource we have to bring services in as close to budget as we can, albeit there are areas where there are just you know, excessive pressures, on the basis that that's the best way we, we would hope to secure sustainable investment going forward. It was to demonstrate but, that we can. But we're still cutting services. No, Deputy, I would not accept that we're cutting services. Okay. We, we said it, I just gave you a specific one. The rehabilitative training allowance for new entrants, as of from the September 1st, 2019, is being scrapped. That is for people who leave school with a disability, who are trying to access training programmes, um, that allowance is now being scrapped. So, Deputy, I'm happy to send in a note. I'm not aware of that specific one. Okay. I do know that in the service plan we have an additional £12.5 million specifically for new school entrants who are now needing yep. a day services. Uh, and that includes rehabilitative training as well as ordinary day services. So, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely aware that we're investing €12 million Euro in, the, in the last quarter of the year around new day services for the new cohort. Um, I'll come back to you on that okay. specific point. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. Um, now, Deputy McGrath is our next uh, deputy. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to welcome Mr Desmond and uh, Mr Mulvaney. Uh, thank you both for, for being here. If I can just start by trying to, to reconcile the fact that the HSE's figures up to the end of April this year show a revenue deficit of €116 million. Euro. And can you just put that in context for us in relation to the, the fiscal monitor, uh, which shows the overall uh, performance of the health vote, and that shows an underspend, and it's a combination of current and capital, but a total underspend of €28 million. Uh, up to the end of uh, up to the end of June or up to the end of April, I think it was about 20 million. So, can you just reconcile the difference? Um, specifically, deputy, um, the figures of 116 million represents the position for the first three months of the year. There, up to April. Um, four months. Yeah. Four months, um, and that represents 2.3% uh, of the available budget and the main drivers of that are given there. Um, the clarification you were looking for was exactly what? Can you reconcile that to the fact that the official overall exchequer figures for up to the end of April uh, in health show an underspend of 20 million. So the HSE have an overspend of 116 million versus budget. Uh, the exchequer returns show for health. So the health vote, which would include more than the HSE, but the HSE is predominant element of it shows an underspend. I, I'm trying to reconcile the difference. We, did, I mean, we, we probably had to say that I feel, and I think it probably was think a, we'll a, a parliamentary question, but yeah. as, you, as you said, first of all, we're comparing two different time periods, albeit one is later. No, the um, April one for the Exchequer is, is a £20 million underspend, so so the HSE is £116 so million. So that's yeah. capital and revenue the, yep. uh, for the entire vote, which is more than just the HSE? The 116 that Colin referred to is the revenue, so the current yeah. expenditure on the HSE, and the HSE's current expenditure is prepared on an income, you know, on a accruals basis, as opposed to a cash vote basis. So we'd have to, I suppose, line the two up and show you how they reconcile them, and that, that can be done. Okay, so on the uh, on the current side, as opposed to, to capital, the health uh, underspend to the end of April uh, in the exchequer returns uh, is 38 million. Uh, of an underspend, so I'm trying to compare that then to uh, what the HSE have reported of 116 million. So which which is recording it on a cash basis and which is so recording the, it the, on an accrual? The, the underspend that's in the vote is the cash basis. Yeah, and that's behind obviously the figure of the 116 million, which is an income and expenditure yeah. accrual based figure. Now I'm not saying this is reconciliation, deputy, but if you take a month's worth of accruals and sure. a month's worth of payments on a 16 billion system. You'll, of which in four months you have about you know three or four billion of it, you'll, you'll start to see, well, why, why would you have the two differences? Obviously, how the cash may be profiled and how the budget may be profiled will also be part of, the, part of the difference. So it can be reconciled at an overall level, but as I said, the, the HSE's systems um, do income and expenditure, the vote is on cash. So we are 
we're not quite comparing apples with oranges or apples with apples, but we can at a high level reconcile it. Uh, difficult to do verbally here, but we can okay. certainly set it out. Would it be possible to send that to the committee, uh, a high level reconciliation? Yes, um, because the, the way in which we account for expenditure has come in for some criticism, even in the recent OECD report on, on public accounting uh, in Ireland, and it just makes it very difficult for policymakers um, and legislators such as us to, to get a proper handle on the numbers. Um, so I think what I hear you saying is that the, the single biggest reason is that the exchequer return figures are cash-based, money in, money out whereas the figure the HSE reported 116 million of a deficit is actually a more accurate measure because it takes account of known liabilities which have not yet been paid. It's accruals. It's so, accruals based yeah. that, yes. so bills that you have received in before the end of April but not yet paid uh, are accounted for in your uh, estimate of a deficit of 116 million. So that's the one that we should be looking at more. So when you need the bigger factors in the difference, but we can reconcile the difference at the high level for you. Okay. What are the other main elements in the overall health vote apart from the HSC, uh, Mr. Desmond? So you have the dimension, deputy, um, and as well as that, you have various payments for pension, state claims agency, and matters of that nature as well, um, which also have to be taken into account. Okay. Okay. So if we could get that, it would be it would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Just uh, on the capital plan, and picking up from Deputy O'Brien's questioning, um, what month typically is the capital plan adopted in the last number of years? When has the capital plan been adopted? Well, I think a capital plan wasn't formally adopted in recent years. Um, I think it's not a requirement under legislation that it formally be so. The HSE operated under capital allocation and came in on budget on those allocations in recent years. Um, but it would be desirable that there is a capital plan formally agreed. Well, when was the last HSE capital plan uh, formally adopted? I haven't checked that, but um, as my colleague said, it, it's been a, some time since one was formally adopted. But what I, what I could, what I say adopted, formally approved by the department. Obviously, the capital plan that we submit is adopted by the HSC before it's submitted. But a kind of key point to note is that the, I think, the 640 million capital we have this year, about 75% um, of it is construction, construction capital. About 75% of it is pre-committed. So it is rolling. It is, you know, the projects are proceeding. The, you know, buildings are being refurbished or buildings are being built. Equipment is being bought. So um, the, the new capital plan or the new iteration of a capital plan, because they are all multi-annual in any given year, is about moving on new projects or moving existing projects from you know, one phase to the next. But the vast bulk of the money we have is already, capital, already contractually yeah. committed to an existing series of projects. And those projects are not being delayed or they're not, they're not waiting for the approval. Okay. They are moving ahead. So is there a rolling HSC capital plan? There is definitely. That, that is the reality of capital plans everywhere, is that it, they are a mo Right, but it's not capital. adopted by the department or approved by the minister. It can be approved by the minister. It would be ideal that it should be, but it isn't an absolute requirement. So when was the last one adopted by the minister? Well, I don't think in the last two years, certainly, that I recall one being adopted by the minister formally. But that's just the nature of the... And what purpose is served by adopting a 2019 capital plan in July 2019? Well... It would be a very good advantage for us to do so because we haven't in recent years, so it would be very desirable to do so, except for the fact that there were certain additional costs arose, uh, as we're aware, and therefore that required considerably more work to reconcile and get that plan in place. But it would be a desirable that the plan should be adopted by the Minister, and that's the Minister's intention to do so. And if it's adopted, would it be a 2019 capital plan or a 2019 to 2022 plan? Or It would be 2019, but as... Um, Stephen has explained, it's always a rolling plan over a three-year basis. Therefore, you have the challenge of reconciling the plan in each year, ensuring that you come in on budget, which we did in 2018, and ensuring at the same time that all of the projects that are underway are funded, and therefore there's quite a significant amount of management of those projects on a three-year basis. Does the basis. whole thing not seem very loose, <coughs> very ad hoc, and kind of make it up as you go along? And there I, doesn't seem to be any real structure for this. I mean, you can't even tell us for sure when the last HSC capital plan was approved. You think maybe it was two years ago, where more than half, more than halfway through 2019, we don't have an approved capital plan for 2019. We have an approved allocation for capital. Yes, I know that. We yeah. have the projects underway and all allocated against those projects where there are contractually committed projects. But what plan are you working to in spending that money? 
Well, the allocation from the government for 2019 was 742, 642. Yeah, yeah but plus what the capital addition. plan are you working to in spending that capital allocation? A considerable, well, amount allocation of the, is, yeah, a considerable amount of the projects, as explained, would have been running on from previous years, so large capital projects and the, the smaller infrastructure works and medium-sized projects are all underway anyway. Therefore, the HSE would indent the relevant amount of funding required and is enabled under Exchequer rules to spend a certain amount of that funding on a, on a, a rolling basis. Okay, but they don't necessarily come from a capital plan. They come from the HSE's rolling investment programme, <coughs> is what I'm in kind of fairness, hearing. In fairness to the HSE, has submitted a draft uh, capital plan, and therefore it's a question of ensuring that uh, the, the Exchequer can provide the necessary funding for that, and the um, recent summary economic state provided much needed clarity to enable that plan to be finalised. There's, yeah, two I mean, I there's, sure. there's, a, there's a great deal of rigour in, in the HSE and between the HSE and the Department around the capital plan. The draft plan that's submitted is the plan that we're working to. As we said, 75% of it is contractually committed. Yeah. Um, that's proceeding. And um, it, it absolutely is preferable to have a, a, a formally signed off plan. But we are working to a plan and there is a lot of rigour. We wouldn't want to give any impression that there isn't. Um, there's a lot of rigour around the public procurement. And as Colin has said, we have not had an issue inside the HC's capital plan in any recent year of having overspends. So it is very tightly managed. Yeah, but would it not be, to put it mildly, preferable for the HSE to be working to an agreed capital plan that you know is signed off early in the year, and this is what we are going to put into the pipeline by way of projects and to approve from the Department and the Minister? You don't seem to have that. It would be. There okay. was a fair degree, Deputy, of um, change in the last year with the finalisation of the National Development Plan and prior to that the mid-year review. So okay. there was quite a bit just of examination two other issues, if I may, Chair. One is just on that, on the, the NDP, the National Children's Hospital. So in terms of the funding, so in the in the memo that was published from the uh, deeper section, Robert Watt back in, it was, the memo was dated in, in May in relation to the, the broadband plan, his assessment of that. He said the extra funding needed for the National Children's Hospital over the period 2020 to 2022 was 385 million euro. So can you just account for that? So in the summer economic statement, we have a figure of 200 million in for 2020, which is for the hospital and also any potential broadband expenditure above and beyond what's provided for, for broadband. Uh, so how much of the 200 million relates to the Children's Hospital? for 2020 or do you have an estimate of that and then where will the balance of the shortfall come from? I don't have an estimate as to where from the 200 million provided by the Minister for Public Expenditure Reform would actually break out at this point in time. The 385 million that you quoted, a certain amount of the capital plan was already funded from the allocation provided for capital um, for 2019 at the beginning. Um, when the additional cost transpired on the Children's Hospital, uh, a process ensued whereby, as you know, there was a 75% contribution and 25% from the Health Service Executive. So the costs, therefore additional costs arose, and it is to accommodate what they may be okay. that the Minister has announced his... But, 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 okay, but you, can you tell us today what is the amount that is required above and beyond what is in the base, what is provided for in your future allocations that you know of now, mm -hmm. how much extra is required for the National Children's Hospital? I don't have the breakdown available with me. We can provide a breakdown to the Deputy. But you accept it was £385 million, uh, well, as of May, according to Deeper? Well, the Children's Hospital was funded up to the tune of the 980, I'm, I'm quoting broad figures, from the original up to before the GMP process, and so therefore there was an annual amount each year for the Children's Hospital within that, and that is what would be comprised within the figures of 2020 to 2022. When the GMP process was concluded, an additional 450 million, therefore, uh, was the cost that was agreed by the government, and therefore the figure you've given to me might have different components within it. I'm simply saying it would be best that we provide you with a breakdown. Can of you come that. back to the committee with that? We can come back Thank to you. the committee. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Deputy. Uh, Deputy Boyd Barish. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, just really following on from the, the last uh, set of questions, I mean, uh, the, the key issue is whether the extra money required for the National Children's Hospital is it's delayed, it would seem, uh, if I understand you correctly, it's delayed the publication of the, of the capital plan. Uh, and presumably that is because it impacts on other parts of that plan. Uh, and you trying to figure out how much money you're going to get extra from the government and then cover the shortfall 
uh, is got, it, it, the consequence of that is you're trying to figure out how it will impact on other capital projects. Is, am, am I right? Well, the and can you tell us what those, if that is the case, it is going to impact? Well, looking at the capital investment plans for the health sector, in addition to the Children's Hospital, there are many other capital projects already underway, and they're at various stages of development. You'll be aware of some of those. Um, and these are ongoing and, and will be completed at various time frames and are on target broadly. The radiation oncology, for instance, in Cork, Galway and Dublin, the new forensic hospital in Port Ran. So there are significant, the rehabilitation hospital in Dunlira, for example, there are significant projects underway and at various stages of, of being But is completed. it going to, okay, I accept that, but is, is, is the, uh, the extra money required for the children's hospital going to impact on the timeline of other capital projects? Is it going to delay them? For example, uh, Deputy Breed Smith asked me about, for example, the Drimna, Drimna Primary Care Centre, which has been due since uh, June 2009. And people in Drimna are wondering where it is. Is the overspend of the National Children's Hospital going to impact on that and other the timeline for the delivery of other capital projects such as that? The government has committed that where projects are contractually committed, it will proceed with those projects. It will also proceed with a broad range of necessary infrastructural work that's always needed on an annual basis. Uh, it is then uh, incumbent on the government to examine the funding that's available to it to see when additional projects can actually be... If you don't mind me saying that's real politician's answer now, uh, and clearly... Your unwillingness to answer that would seem to give away the fact that it is going to impact on other capital projects, on the, the timeline for the delivery of other capital Can I projects. That, I mean, there's an issue here about what is a capital project. Um, so well, I gave you an example, the Drimna Primary Care Centre. So I, I don't unfortunately know the specifics of that project and where, where it's at in the overall approval process or if it has been approved. So there's a simpler reality, the more capital funding you have, the more, let's say, um, ideas can become uh, proposals, can become you know projects on a list, and can move through the various stages, including getting approved and moving on. So there's no doubt the more capital you have, the more projects you can you can progress. Um, as to whether any project is is going to be delayed, I mean the HSE was clear. Um, as this was this has been in the media and it was here in the public accounts committee was clear about the fact that certainly we saw timing issues with the availability of capital cash, um, particularly in the the next couple of years. Um, the summary economic statement uh, provided a welcome buffer or contingency or overall uh, resource of 200 million for broadband and children's hospital, which makes that much more straightforward uh, and arithmetic. But it, and as I said, all but it doesn't cover the whole short. It doesn't co cover the whole shortfall, does it? And therefore, uh, the timelines for other capital projects had to be but for the, for changed. The, for the year in question, again, depending on its allocation. Um, it will depend on what the overall shortfall is for, for, for next year. But the figure we were grappling with from memory was a cash flow figure of about a share of, a, of 100 million for next year. So, um, so the, the, you know, we're, we're going to progress with our contractually committed projects. They're moving ahead, uh, have, have been all, all year. And the question of how many other projects can advance and to what stage will be a product of what's the total available cash. It's wrong to say this has been delayed because of that. You know, you could say they're all been delayed because there isn't 100 million more or 300 well, million more. Well, look, I mean, I won't labour the point, but I read, I, I read from what you're saying that, and that's why we've had the delay is because you, you've had to uh, ch change timelines for delivery of other things because of the children's hospital. But uh, can I ask just one specific question about the children's hospital? Who made the decision that there should be a private? Um, section to the uh, National Children's Hospital, give, given the fact that we have a government commitment to universality and to removing private practice from uh, public hospitals, who made that decision and could you tell us about the economics of it? How much did it cost to put in a private uh, section? I don't know the specific answer, Deputy. Um, we could, it's, it's a very factual question, so we can find a specific answer. Yeah. Um, if I had to surmise, I'd suggest it was probably the uh, Children's Hospital Ireland, who are the main customer for the development board who are building the Children's Hospital. Uh, you made a point about um, 
government references to universality and removing private practice. Um, and Sound Care talks about that. It does talk about a process initially to look at what would that involve. But the reality today is, and tomorrow and next week is, we have consultants who have contra contracts, and those contracts allow for an element of private practice. So um, I don't know if it's fair but, to say yet that it's government but policy. Then, but then, but that that is the position, actually, Deputy. I mean, the uh, Chief Executive of Children's Hospital Ireland explained the position at length at a recent committee hearing. I think the Joint Health Committee I could be corrected, and it was to reflect within the Children's Hospital the structure of the health sector as the health service as it is. But this that point means in, time, in, in a new with a very limited amount of private area within the overall. So it then remains that if there is a change uh, from the Sanchez perspective and other work ongoing in this public-private, that that takes its course. Oh, well, I, I, in a hospital that is a state-of-the-art hospital, which is pointing in towards the future of healthcare in this country, to me it is absolutely extraordinary uh, that it is going to have uh, a private section when there's a government commitment uh, to have universality and to eliminate the two-tier system. Uh, a brand new hospital uh, is going to have two tiers and it's going to have them for ever and a day. And I don't, to be honest, I don't really accept the uh, contract uh, argument because surely you could have said, and I, 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 can, just, can you clarify, does that mean you had no role whatsoever in this? That the HSE had no role so, whatsoever in a decision about whether there should be a public and a, a private part, the National Children's Hospital, and could you not have simply told paediatricians who wanted to work in that hospital the only jobs that are going in this hospital are public-only contracts. My recollection, Deputy, from that other committee hearing that I was present at was that there are entitlements on practice, and those entitlements are naturally honoured until such time as the entitlements of practice, public or private consultants, actually change by way of an agreed policy change. So in fairness, when the hospital was at the planning stage, it would have to adhere to those um, contractual structures no, that no, exist. These are new contracts. With, and they, there are various. Yeah. Sorry, two things. One, Deputy, you're entering your final minute. And secondly, we are really straying into the area of the Health Committee in this, rather than the budget side, just, just for... Well, I, I did ask how much it costs. We, yeah. we need to know how much it's costing yeah, that's, that's, of that, public that, money that's, yeah, that's to our, have a two-tier system. Yeah, but that's, right? It has that's budgetary, budgetary, budgetary implications, yeah. and also in terms of the, the contracts of the consultants, it has budgetary implications, and I don't accept. Because in the existing hospitals, where there's existing contracts, yeah. you can make that argument. I don't see how you can make that argument about new contracts, because there'd be new contracts, surely, for the consultants in the National Children's yeah. Hospital. I don't know the specifics of the contractual piece, Deputy. A, we're, there's a danger of straying into commenting on policy, which I'm not going to do. But the, the vast bulk of the paediatricians who will be the staff of that new hospital on day one are, I would imagine, the paediatricians who are currently the staff of Crumlin, Talla, and... Um, the Temple Street. So it is those paediatricians and other staff that we will largely form the staff of the new hospital. So I, I, they may be given a new contract, perhaps, I don't know, but they are existing staff members. Well, look, I have one more question, but I would like to know if there's going to be new contracts, because if there is, then we actually would have the power to say public-only contracts, and we wouldn't have to have a two-tier. So I just make that point, and I'd appreciate if you could get back to us on that. Uh, just lastly, the... Um, do I re do I, you don't want to call them cutbacks because of the impact of the deficit. Uh, the word here in, where you talk about the savings that may be necessary, you call them interventions. Interventions, which is a nice euphemism for cuts. Uh, but uh, the interventions in order to deal with the deficit of staffing and savings uh, would I be right in saying that they're going to be in the area where, the, where most of the overruns are, which you list? Uh, disability services, acute hospitals, PCRS and overseas treatments. Is it in those areas where the overruns are that the interventions, which you don't want to call cuts, uh, will take place in order to meet the deficit? And isn't that inevitably going to worsen the situation for patients in those areas. So the, in, in terms definitely of some of the areas you mentioned where, so if, again if you go back to the 16 billion, four of it is in the areas of PCRS, pensions, state claims and um, 
overseas treatment abroad and cross-border directive. We, they're largely governed by policy legislation. We don't have specific interventions we can, we can make there unless somebody changes policy, with some exceptions around probity and PCRS. Um, so PCRS is focused on making sure people, people get the eligibility they're entitled to as quickly as possible. And then the bit we can control is A, um, ensuring that there's, I suppose, probity, in other words, no breaking of the rules by any by the small minority of contractors that might be tempted to do so for the 2.7 billion that we're, we're handing out. So that allows us to make some savings that don't impact on uh, on patients. In fact, it's for the benefit of patients because the money tends to stay in PCRS and get used for services. Um, we're also through PCRS encouraging um, the hospital consultants to appropriately prescribe biosimilar drugs. Now that is a positive thing. Uh, that will save us, hope, we would hope, a lot of money next year. And when I say save us money, it will provide space for effectively new drug costs. So that's a, I, wouldn't, I haven't used the word intervention, that's a cost saving measure that is not negative in any way around service, couldn't be called, neither of those could be called cuts, and they're just the right thing to do. And we assume we're expected to where we can to live within the resource. Now, on the operational service areas, yes, there is an element of operating within budget. So if you take home health services, there's been about 150 million extra invested in home health over the last three or four years. We are requiring our services to live within their budgets for home health. Is there more demand for home health services, which if you had the money, you would want to spend it on? And is home health a valuable service? Is it absolutely excellent for patients? Yes and yes. But if we don't have the money, are we going to spend it on something we don't have rather than simply making best use of what we have? Uh, no, we're not. Our intention is to live within the home health budget, home support budget, on the basis that that should assist us to secure greater investment in future years. So that is, now is that a cut? Um, that, yeah. that, that's, that's, that, that depends well, on your perspective. If, if somebody's entitled to something and they're, they're giving it, but, they, but they're not giving it. Thank you. Thank you, well, Deputy. We will come to the not, so not that we're taking it away, we're just not able to give not response to the demand that we don't have money for. Thank you, Mr. Romani. Now I'm going to move now to Deputy Brannock. Thanks for the presentation. Um, it's sort of re reminded to think of um, what Brian Cowan described uh, the Department of Health as a bit like Angola, and I think things are still not good in the state of Angola. Um, you have a budget of 17.107 billion, 11.6% increase on the budget of 2018. Uh, my question is, how does the HSE currently, current budget position compare to its position at the same point last year? We have been informed that uh, it's currently running a 6.8% over budget, and at a minimum by the end of the year, it could be anything up to 150 million deficit. And obviously the question here is, you know, how are you going to plug that hole? Is that a correct figure, or do you anticipate that it will be even greater than that? Uh, I'm particularly also interested in the issue of the budgetary oversight group. I mean, obviously they're called positive steps to ensure better management and health expenditure. Can you talk the committee through how these work? Because uh, anecdotally, and while I can't put my finger on it, you've just referenced uh, home care packages uh, not being provided and that you're living uh, within uh, the budget. I mean, it's clear to me, and in fact, uh, I have a, a, a topical in the next half an hour in relation to callous cuts that have already been implemented. And are those cuts being suggested by this Budgetary Oversight Committee, for example, a proposal to close uh, uh, a disability service for respite and, and holidays uh, for up on 50 clients uh, in the North East later this year. Does this committee make decisions like that and how are they decided upon? Because it's striking me as if it's the vulnerable, same as the home care packages, uh, disability service and vulnerable that have been impacted. And, you know, assuming that these uh, contingencies are in place uh, for higher than anticipated expenditure. How will the cuts be decided, and is there uh, a public information available to elected representatives, be they locally or nationally, in relation to those, or are they just being foisted and will be foisted uh, 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 upon communities? Because it strikes me that if you can't live within your budget, and I understand the constraints that you're under, that 
you know, why should we be discussing new services uh, that we shouldn't really be even suggesting politically if we can't deliver to the most vulnerable in our society? And uh, I'd ask you to comment on that. So, Deputy, it's, it's a valid question as to to what extent you ensure you, you fund fully what's already running before you establish new services. That's a matter for the Minister and the, the political system on an annual basis um, in terms of allocating a, a total resource. But the, I haven't got the figures with me from last year, but having checked them previously and we can send on a note, my recollection is that the figures at the end of April, which is 2.3% over on, uh, on the HSE's current account, so 116.2 million as per the opening statement from my colleague. So we're 116 million over and 80 million of that is in the operational service area and about 40 in pensions, demand beds, primary care service, where we don't have uh, as much, uh, let's say, management control in terms of the, the components. That was a, both of those were higher last year and the proportion that was in the operational services was higher as a proportion of the total um, last year. So we are better than it was um, last year. Now, you can take four months at 116 and simply extrapolate it and say, well, what would that be at the year end? Our, obviously, we're not planning to have that level of deficit. We're planning to reduce um, any deficit as much as possible, particularly focusing on those operational service areas where we have more direct controls. We have less direct controls in pensions and demand leads. Um, in terms of the specific example in the North East, I'm not aware, I'm not aware of that. Um, the Budget Oversight Group per se doesn't make specific, <coughs> certainly in my understanding, doesn't make specific decisions around specific measures. It is an early warning and a, an oversight mechanism for the Department of Public Expenditure Reform and the Department of Health to engage the HSE around progress to date, progress around savings, where are we against the overall budget and what is it um, looking like towards the year end. It's not into that specific level of detail. We have given managers out budgets and we have asked them, we, we have, I suppose, the, the CEO, as he is now, has been very clear in his public pronouncements that um, he accepts our managers don't have sufficient budget to meet all the demands that they face, and he will support them where they have to make difficult prioritisation decisions, as long as they make them properly and communicate them properly. That includes communicating properly with local, with local communities. So the, the notion of an entire respite service in the North East closing would sound Strange to me, but we, we can certainly, if you can share some of the details of that, well, we can, we can you know, check in on that. It, you're, you're clearly saying uh, that you don't make the decisions, or indeed the budgetary oversight group, but then it's delegated to managers to live within the budget, and therefore they make the make the suggestion of cuts. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with uh, what I'm going to debate later on here, but it's clear to me that those managers are identifying services uh, that are hugely needed in be it my community or other people's community and effectively if you can't come in on budget and if the figure uh, we can agree to disagree but I'd like you to come back to the committee because clearly the figures that we're presenting uh, I have no reason to disbelieve them that uh, you're saying you expect to come in or hope to come in on budget we're saying effectively that you certainly at a minimum will be 150 million and if that 150 million is delivered in the form of cuts if the people who suffer are the vulnerable, and I, I personally uh, believe that that has to be communicated to those communities, and it's not happening. Uh, yeah, no, I'm finished. I'm just simply saying, uh, you know, you, you use the mid-reference to the fact, and I heard Jonathan O'Brien refer to them as uh, interventions. You said they're not called cuts; they're operating to a budget, and I understand that, but it's the the impact that it is uh, having. And going to have, and I stand over what I said, uh, for financial reasons, a local manager has indicated that a respite service has been totally removed in order to, for him to come within budget and will discontinue at the end of 2019. And that is unacceptable uh, either to me as a national uh, uh, public representative or indeed not even to be communicated to the, to the clients only by way of letter. If I could just on that point, Chair, if I could make a general point, the National Service Plan provision this year, 2019, had a considerable additional funding of about a billion euros provided by the government. And we also had the benefit of the supplementary estimate agreed at the end of last year. And the current P625, give or take roughly a million, also went into the base. So the government provided very, very handsomely for the health um, 
system this year on the National Service Plan, which is up by that level compared to the previous year. And there have been increases in prior years as well, which was the subject of a previous discussion at this committee. So it is very challenging to meet the demand for the services, but I think the context is important to understand in terms of what the Minister did deliver for the 2019 National Service Plan. And if I can just I'm not saying we expect to break even, I'm saying we're not, we're not planning for a deficit and what we're planning to do is to mitigate any deficit absolutely insofar as we can. The, I'm also not implying that because the Budget Oversight Group, which involves senior colleagues from deeper and the Department of Health, doesn't make that kind of specific decision. I'm not saying we simply leave it up to the local managers and therefore in some way it's all their fault. What we are saying to local managers is obviously we look for efficiencies first. Um, then they have to live within their overall budget. If that means they can't meet all the demand, well, then they can't meet all the demand. That's, that's the reality. And we mean it when we say, you know, we have to support them to make difficult decisions as long as they make them properly and communicate them properly. So, you know, not communicating such a decision if that was being made to uh, families well in advance wouldn't be communicating properly. Now, I don't know the details. So I don't no, I'm not expecting you to. I don't think it's the way to do business. And I, I understand uh, that considerable money has been fed up. Sorry, Chairman, to come back, but uh, that doesn't um, justify that we should not be suggesting new services if we can't deliver to the most vulnerable in our community. And I wait with interest to see how many more services uh, will be uh, curtailed or, or stopped as a result of the overruns. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy. Now, um, next Deputy indicating is Deputy O'Reilly. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thank you both for uh, for your submissions. Um, I, yeah, I, I've, I've got three so far. So we have mitigated the deficit, reprofile, and interventions. All of those things mean the same thing. They mean cuts, but that's what they mean to the people who aren't going to be getting the service. So whether it's a service expected and not delivered or uh, an actual cut, the, the net effect on the people who need the services, it's actually just the same. Um, I, I want to refer to a letter that was sent by yourself, Mr Desmond, um, on the 11th of April 2019, and you make reference to the savings measurement plan uh, of March 31st, 2019, and the monitoring groups. So my question is, I had a look for those reports and I couldn't find them. Um, are they are they published or where are they published? So forgive me now if they're if they're they're there. I just couldn't see them when I went to look for them. They would constitute, I presume, documentation discussed in the Budget Oversight Committee, and that would be ongoing work, I would imagine. Um, I'm not immediately familiar with the correspondence, Deputy, but we can clarify exactly what reports may be available. Okay, so it's a letter from yourself dated the 11th of April 2019 to Miss Anne O'Connor. Mm -hmm. uh, it says to the, the uh, value improvement programme, the department is acutely aware of the different approach and the different approach required in 2019 and it is evident from the submission that there has been considerable engagement at operational level to develop and formulate a monitoring and reporting arrangement around it. Um, so I'm wondering that monitoring and reporting arrangement that, that, does that, are there reports on that? See, what we're all trying to get a handle on here is how the uh, deficit mitigation, reprofiling or interventions or cuts, as we might call them just for shorthand, are going to impact on the people that we're representing. So, we, we have a, a, so the, if there is a series of reports out there that indicate where some of that reprofiling or whatever might be going on, it's it, it's not to, to to me anyway. It seems a bit unfair that that information would be available. I see no reason why it wouldn't be published, I'm even clear. on an ongoing interim basis. Sorry, I'm clear on the correspondence now. Thank you. Um, when the service plan was published at the end of last year with a significant additional funding for a range of areas that were, I mentioned, it did indent a series of savings that needed to be achieved to balance that service plan against the provision provided by the government. And that set out in the service plan um, as published. The budgetary oversight group was set up roughly at the very beginning of the year and the purpose of that budget oversight group is in a collaborative way between ourselves, colleagues in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and the HSE to work through how we would actually achieve what the service plan sets out to achieve in terms of delivering this significant additional funding across a range of areas but also recognising that the level of funding available 
regrettably, is never enough for the scale of demand facing the sector. And what the process that I was writing to Mr. Connor about was simply deepening down to the level of how we might actually engage within that process and maybe get greater clarity on how those savings might be achieved. If there's documentation that can be made available, we can certainly look into that. But the process of work of the oversight group is continuing on at this point in time. Okay, so the monitoring group referred to in that correspondence <coughs> is the oversight group? I would imagine I'd have to look at the correspondence, but essentially, let me put it this way, we are doing our work within a collaborative process under the Budget Oversight Group, which is chaired by Deeper, and that is where we are progressing the implementation of yeah, And I understand that you have to have your procedures, I get that, but I have to tell you, honestly, sometimes you just don't help your own cause with the, with the groups and the committees and the etc, etc. And it could be, I am perfectly willing to accept that that information is publicly available, but as someone who has a small degree of experience dealing with the health service and, and a, a public representative, it should be available, certainly, to me. I can't find it. And when I can't find information like that that's referenced in, in documentation that obviously exists in some form, well, then that naturally begs the question, OK, what is it that you don't want me to know? And it might be that there's nothing to see here. But if there is nothing to see here, then you should just publish it. Because we all know that cuts are coming in our communities to the services for the people who need them. What we want to know is where those cuts are going to come and how it is going to impact. And I think that if you are monitoring this on an ongoing basis and you have oversight, but well, that information should be shared. Okay. Um, uh, Mr Mulvaney, you and I have spoken previously about the stretch income targets for uh, private income into uh, the public health service. Um, there was some, and myself and your, your, your colleague Mr Woods as well, have also um, had some discussions about it at the Health Committee. Are the stretch income targets still in place? Well, there's, there's, uh, again, I think I had, a, I had a conceptual difficulty last time as to what we meant by stretch in, income targets. So I can assure you that the, the last thing we've done this year in the NSP 2019 is we had to invest 85 million, but we had to put money in to hospitals effectively to reduce their income targets because of the largely because of the uh, call it the impact of the campaign by insurers to encourage people which people are entitled to do not to use their private insurance if they're going through the emergency department route so um we are we we have lower income targets this year than we had last year and um, some people are still off those targets and um, if they're choosing to call that a stretch i would say that's just inaccurate they have income targets um, they're lower than last year. Um, you know, what, what does the stretch thing mean? I'm not quite so sure. But so just that well, they have targets they, to they, control. Steve, you know that, that those were not my words. Those were the words contained in correspondence between uh, CEO and the HSE. They, they, they may Stretching. Not have been. No, no, but that wasn't something that I invented or thought well, about. I had to dream about. They, you know, they, <laughs> they came. They came from very sad. That that phrase came from a very senior person in the HSE, and you know that. I mean, there's, I, didn't, I didn't make it up. Certainly the perception is that uh, stretch income targets were imposed on people uh, and were imposed on hospital CEOs. But if you're telling me now that they, uh, they no longer exist, I'm happy to accept that. Um, with regard to the, and this issue has been raised already, but it's, it's, it's something that uh, I think might, might warrant another mention the uh, private wing or the private unit or the private part of the new national children's hospital we've been assured by children's health ireland uh, and bearing in mind like the, the building of this private facility my apologies the, the, I, i'll conclude i just one more question after you, this chair if you, I sorry Deputy, just to explain to you there's, there's, there's no problem we just do a round of questions and then and they're back. I thought so they were 10 can, minutes chair back. in yeah. the health committee they're 10 my yeah, apologies okay. I, I thought I had twice there's no problem That's just, not, uh, okay. just okay uh, but just with regard to the I mean it has its own entrance it sounds like it's going to be lovely if you can afford to pay for it um, but like I say one way or another we're all going to be paying for it actually we were assured, given an assurance that somehow that money was going to be recouped so is there a separate budget within the budget for the National Children's Hospital, the capital spend on that, for the private wing, so that we could be assured that not just the ongoing cost, but the actual cost of building it could be recouped? Is there a separate 
do you know exactly how much it's going to cost so that you know exactly how much you're going to be recouping back for it? I understand the question, Deputy. I don't have an answer unless my colleague has an answer. We can get an answer. We can get an answer, Deputy, but again, I think that was dealt with in a lot of detail by the Chief Executive of Children's Hospital Ireland. I'm not sure it's a separate wing as such. I think there was just simply management. Uh, well, it has its own entrance and all, so, well, you know. Um, but certainly we can pose that question. I'm not aware of any separation of costs within the overall budget for this. Mm. The hospital is being built by a, a vast budget across a range of construction headings. And I think the construction, the equipping and the medical and laboratory equipping is the structure within which this huge mm. project is being dri but, driven. But my point was a very simple one. It was if you don't know how much we're spending on this, well, then you absolutely can't be sure that we're going to be recouping the cost of it from uh, the private paying patients, because if you don't know how much it is, you'll never know if you've ever recouped it. It's well, just fairly simple. Well, the question of recoupment is something that I'd have to clarify for you. Okay. Deputy, the, the recoupment is a separate thing. There's no part of this that you can't estimate the cost or work out the cost for. So we just don't know here what the cost is. I'd be fairly sure the, both CHI and the Development Board know within a reasonable figure what the cost of that is. The recoupment question is a separate question. We can okay. Thanks, Jeff. I'll come back in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, Deputy Doherty was here and he had indications, so I'm just going to go straight to, if you, unless you want to catch your breath. Okay. <laughs> okay, Deputy Doherty. Thank you. Um, and sorry for uh, working before, between committees. Um, you're very welcome. And I've just a, a couple of small questions. Uh, and it's around the National Children's Hospital that a lot of my colleagues have, have raised before this. What is the. Um, the square footage of the National Children's Hospital now. What size is it? Very specific questions, I think, Deputy, we'd have to... Roughly, do, do, do we... OK. Sorry, Deputy Doherty, just in terms of... This is a budget oversight committee, and we have invited people in on the basis that they're discussing the budget situation. Yeah. I think you have to be reasonable to witnesses. There was no indication of square footage of a hospital. No, look, I'm not... Just to be, just to be fair... Chairperson. The chairperson, no, of course you're going to be fair. I, I'm not asking, I'm not trying, this isn't a get you moment. I'm just, okay, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I was trying to Google it myself quickly just to see, because the questioning goes like this, if you would uh, mind. The significant, in relation to the National Children's Hospital and the location that it is compared to the previous version of the National Children's Hospital at the matter site, is the size roughly the same? Is it significantly different? On your first question, I was going to say, well, it has 6,000 rooms broadly, so it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, building. Is it a different size overall? Square footage and what was the matter? I don't know. It's a, not a question that I was assuming I was coming here for. It's a perfect No, well, the reason, the reason I'm asking this, the reason I want to get to this point is that we have spent a lot of time discussing the, the overruns uh, in relation to the National Children's Hospital. Um, but once the hospital is built, there's another issue, which is the running of the hospital. So has the department looked at the cost, the annual cost of running this hospital, given the size and scale of the hospital, compared to what the previous version was in the matter? Has that been budgeted in? We absolutely have, Deputy Look at that, as in Children, Children's Hospital Ireland has, and the HC and both the department have, have been shared with that. Um, there is a kind of a, uh, a program of trying to put through a number of service plans so that both the staffing and the other ancillary costs are there by the time the thing opens. The, the biggest, biggest single driver of its overall scale will be the number of beds and the fact that it is, I think, almost entirely, if not entirely, single bedded with capacity for. Uh, an individual, to actually, you know, a parent or a, a family member to stay in most, I, I couldn't be sure. So the rooms are big. It covers a big area. Now, as against that, we are trying to make it as efficient as possible. And again, the chair of CHI, the development board, are much better able to talk to this. But the, there's a lot of work going on to try and make sure, for example, that it has um, a logistics system that doesn't require it to have its own big store, which would take up a lot of space, that it's serviced by one of our centralised distribution hubs. So, so yes is the answer, and we could certainly come back, or relevant colleagues could set out what's known to date about that. But there's a lot of work done on what would it cost both to run the hospital itself, but also the fact that the hospital itself would only work if it, it fits within an overall model of paediatric care for Ireland, which has to also be um, marshalled. So the biggest part of what um, 
Ailish Hardiman's role is, is she's not building the hospital. The biggest thing she has to do, she has to be ready to, I suppose, bring it live and then fit it into the overall construct of paediatric care in Ireland. And there are costings for those bits well beyond what the actual building, you know, construction terms costs and equipping terms. So certainly attention has turned, even though the thing is years from opening, has turned to what's the revenue cost of operating this. And there are estimates available for that. Have those estimates increased in recent years? Um, there's a governance process deputy around all of the different components of the hospital, which is kind of confirming the point just made by my colleague here, and that is going through in a structured way all of those different components, again, that Stephen set out. You have the three existing sites, which are now merging into one hospital group, so you have those running costs and the salary costs of all of the individuals working in those hospitals at all the clinical and other levels, which are obviously within the current base of expenditure for the system. So therefore clearly that advantage is there when you merge three hospitals into one new site, you will have that in the base to bring forward. Obviously, however, when we're now moving to a state-of-the-art hospital in world terms, it will inevitably raise additional costs over time, and it will be a challenge for the health sector, but these aspects are all part of the overall governance structure, which is coordinated by the CHPMP steering group, for example, and uh, with membership from the department, the HSE, the development board, Children's Hospital Ireland across all of the different components, and that includes the equipping piece, the IT electronic records piece, the digital supply piece that was mentioned, and the sheer practical aspects of combining all of the different uh, staffing from the three existing hospitals into one group now under CHI. That legislation has also been passed. The Minister has done his work in that area, so it's now one unified legislative structure for that purpose. So it's a very, very big project along all these streams. I think you're quite right to raise the fact that running costs and revenue are a factor uh, that requires significant planning, other than to say that we have the, the advantage of three existing sites <coughs> and the costs built into the base for those. Yeah. So. If we were to look at the documentation, which we don't have here at, the, at this committee, and, and look at the estimates for the running of the new National Children's Hospital and what was estimated four years ago, would we be looking at the same estimates here today? Well, the recent changes were around the capital building costs, and they were fully documented and publicised yeah, from the government. Forget decision. about capital and on capital. the running costs, deputy. I, I think we'd have to supply you with some more documentation if we could in relation to that. But I mean, I don't have details available to me here today on yeah, that I, issue. I'm going to, Chair, I'm going to make the point to you again, deputy, that there is a point where you invite witnesses in, and they come in to talk to us about a topic. We can keep on asking questions, but if we haven't given any advance notice of this area, we're not the health committee. I mean, they, 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 the witnesses are in before us to discuss budget management and control of health expenditure in the context of budget 2020. So I, you know, I'm just conscious of our time and I'm conscious of okay. witnesses' time and I'm conscious of the new strictures and committees trying to operate within the context. I'm not trying to restrict you um, and I would hope you would appreciate that. But obviously, this, I, I think we're moving to an area where the answer is we don't have the information, we'll send it to you. Well, actually, I was actually going to move to that point okay. um, because this is crucial because we need to make sure that a national capital project, that it takes bricks and mortars to build that, but it also costs money every year thereafter to, to, to keep the lights on, to clean the building, to staff the building, and so on and so forth. And I want to ensure that the runaway cost that we're seeing at one end, which is the capital, is not going to be repeated in relation to the current, because if it is going to be repeated in the current, then there will be lights going off somewhere else in the health service. Um, so I think it is, it is important in terms of, of budgetary management. In relation to the, point of, the, the next point I was going to make, is it possible to supply this committee with the initial estimates, the first estimates that the department received in relation to the running costs of the National Children's Hospital uh, and the estimates as they currently stand? Certainly, take that question away, Deputy, and okay. come back to the committee. Can I? Can I? Just one, if I can, Chair. I mean, if there are initial estimates going back some years that were drafted at the time and we worked on before the thing was, you know, so we have to make sure. It's, it's <coughs> the point we're not making, saying is that once something is draft and then it changes, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to declare it as, as a scandal. So we can set out what the costs are. The Depends why it are. changed. 
What? Depends why you change. Absolutely. But thing, thing, things do change. Drafts are drafts. Estimates are at a point of time based on certain assumptions. Assumptions change. So, I mean, on that basis, we can certainly ask CHI to provide the yeah. current and previous estimates. And I think to be helpful, um, if, if, if there is significant deviation or changes in them, you, you can add a commentary as to why, why, the, why you believe that those changes took place. Um, again, there may have been none. I'm just, I'm just, I, I just want to want to know. In relation to the health overrun, um, I, I asked the Minister for Finance um, why he believes that they're going to buck the trend this year in 2019 compared to any other year that the health budget won't see a significant increase uh, in the last two quarters. Um, because that's what's kind of projected, that it would peak in May, it would reduce and then stabilise for the rest of the year, where the trends year and year have been that there would be uh, an increase in the, in, the, in, the, in the later half of the year. Can you explain why, in your view, that this year will be different from any other year? So the, the, I think definitely certainly there's more focus um, on enhanced financial management control this year. The, um, Clearly, the position we ended up in last year uh, doesn't do anybody uh, uh, a service. Uh, it's not sustainable. Um, so the director of the HSC, as it was at the start of this year, decided that its first priority in implementing the service plan was to maximise the safety of the services we could deliver within the budget and then to make the other improvements that we could without breaching that first priority. Um, so we've been working on that for some time. The new Director General, or CEO, as he is, has added an additional focus to that. He's been very clear that we can't spend money that we, that we don't have, and the route to get sustainable investment is to demonstrate that you can live within the resource, albeit that, that, that can be difficult. So the, our aim is to tighten, not allow, loosen controls as we move into the third quarter, and particularly into the fourth quarter of the year. Um, so we will be growing our overall staffing this year, but we're looking to do it in a way that's planned, you um, will be sorry. What? Growing our overall staffing this year in health, but we're looking to do it in a way that's planned and in a way that's affordable. Talking um, about planning of staff, so I'm sure other deputies will have the same experience of myself uh, as my own. So you talk about planning and, and growing staff and, and so on, but isn't it not the case that the living within your means part of, of what you're saying is that what we're seeing now is our acute hospitals, our community hospitals, are not replacing staff who are on maternity leave in many cases, which can be planned for, because I don't believe that there's a baby boom this year. There's always a, a, a certain percentage of our staff in the health service that will be taking leave, uh, maternity leave during the course of the year. But isn't it not the real case that what's happening because of the new policy in terms of sanctioning replacements or, or um, maternity leave cover and other cover, that we now have major gaps in, in, in services. So definitely what, what we're doing is living within the resource that we have, growing the number overall within the resource <coughs> we have. The control we have in place at the moment effectively says that no additional staff can be put in and that the um, agency and overtime levels, which are in the hundreds of millions, are capped. Um, and within that totality of staff, so we have 54,000 staff in the acute hospital sector alone, within that totality of staff, at the level it's at, other than for specifically Department of Health funded new developments, which can proceed and are proceeding, that is the resource that's available until we get the thing onto some sort of a sustainable footing. Unless, for What reasons, happens when somebody goes on maternity leave? Well, what, what hap what's going to have to happen is somewhere else within the 54,000 staff in, in terms of hospitals, they're going to have to rejig, or somewhere in the 300 million euro worth of agency and overtime, they're going to have to swap some hours and move it around. But surely, this is the point, in terms of budget planning, you know, and, and see the thing is, the Department of Education has a predominantly female workforce. As we do, Deputy. As, you, as the health, that's why I'm using the comparison. The Department of Education has a budget that they don't breach every year, but yet many of their staff take maternity leave. How can they sort it out and the Department of Health can't? Because I have parents coming to me, whether it's their child with speech and language, 
And there's no speech and language in West Donegal because the individual is in maternity leave and there is no cover now to be provided because of this cost cutting uh, cost are remaining within our budget. Pediatry services aren't available since December of last year because the individual is in maternity leave. And, you know, how come, if we can, I can understand this. Deputy. Thank you. I can understand this, that you, we know, if you're looking at a spreadsheet instead of humans and the impact, there is a percentage of the workforce that will be on maternity leave any given year. How come the HSC can't budget for the fact that those individuals will need to be replaced. I actually think it's not just, it's not just a terrible situation for the, the patients and the children that, that require the service. I think it's a terrible situation that we actually put staff of the HSC in, where you're basically, if you're going to maternity leave, your, 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 your patients aren't going to get the cover and the care that they need. How come that can't be budgeted for? Can we, can we have an answer there, sir? So, so I think there's two things, Deputy. One, one, I don't think we're disagreeing that you need to live within the budget. Um, so it, I don't think you can blame the fact that the budget has to be lived within for the fact that in some cases we don't seem to be able to uh, manage maternity leave. The issue is we need to better manage maternity leave so that individual services aren't... You know, the only solution to somebody going on maternity leave is break the budget or don't provide the service. What budget for it in the first place? Well, within the budget for the 54,000. So we have a budget of 7 billion for pay. So you could argue, what are people doing with the overall budget if they're not setting aside some but for maternity leave? That's a, a reasonable question. Okay. But, but they can't Thank just you, overspend because... But who's sanctioning the numbers? Right, well, I'm going to... Uh, the are sanctioning these numbers. Deputy, your, your, your first round of questioning is over, and we, we uh, have uh, Deputy Boyd Barish who's indicated there again. Yeah, uh, first, first of all, just, just to sort of... Um, uh, on reflection... Uh, about the private part of the children's hospital, I just want to, uh, for you to clarify something. The HSE provides the money for that national children's hospital, right? But are you saying that although you provide the money, you uh, have no idea what's going into the hospital? We're, we're, we're not saying the latter, Deputy. The, the money is voted by the Oireachtas, it's given to the department, and the HSE physically gives the money to the um, National Paediatric Hospital Board. In fact, we probably now give it to the Children's Health Ireland, who give it to the, because they're a separate agency, to the Children's um, to the Board. So I'm not in any way saying that the HSE or the department are unaware of um, what goes on and the, the specific decisions and how they get made. No, I'm not saying that for a minute. But, do, but they, don't, they, don't, they don't sort of say, this is what we want. Sorry, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to get my head around is that if you provide the money, surely you say what sort of hospital we want. Yes. So did, in that context, did you say we want a public and a private part or did the people you gave the money to make that decision? I, again, I, I don't know the specifics of the decision, but absolutely the, the funder will have been involved in that decision. Who initiated the question as to should we have a public and private is, is a different thing. But, you know, okay. will, will that decision have been... Thank you, Mr. Mulvay. Deputy, I'm going to, again, to be consistent in the thing. This is a discussion on the budget in uh, the implications for Budget 2020 and public expenditure overrun. Now, if you wish to pursue this and through the... Uh, the the, the health committee and attending it, that's grand, but you, you've, you have gone down this route and because it's outside really of our committee area, I, I'm not going I'm to... I'm just trying to understand the connection between yeah. funding and, and what that we, funding I think then got, delivers. We've got commitment on, um, on areas that you've asked before, but we're, we're now outside the area, so I don't know if you have another question you want to... I don't see it's out the, outside the area to ask what's the connection between the funding and, and the, the thing that it funds. Yeah. Is, that, is that not a reasonable question in, about in, funding? In, re, in relation to the Budget 2020 and public expenditure health overruns. I can offer, Chair, that the yeah. business case and all the tendering documentation for the Children's Hospital was very detailed and extensive and covered all of the different areas that I listed in response to a previous uh, question. 
and that process has been also subject to a very detailed governance. Um, your specific question on the funding flows, well, the government initially approved the funds for the capital project, as an example, of the 980 million figure, give or take, back in early 2017, on the basis of very detailed business case put forward. As time moved on, obviously, we saw that additional costs began to emerge and that had to be revisited. But there is no question, but funding is not provided other than where there's very extensive planning processes underway for that purpose. Uh, the issue of the private piece, which I think is your concern, is slightly more detailed question. And I would refer again to the fact that at this point in time, there are certain rights attaching to practice, and therefore they probably were accommodated within the overall. I'm not sure the scale or the extent to which they would have been part of the overall here and now. That's something we'd have to provide you with more detail on, other than it was set out by Children's Hospital Ireland at the Health Committee, I recall in some detail. Okay, well look, I, I've asked the question and hopefully you'll come back to me with the, the answer. I would just as a, as a, 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 a matter for the record for the discussion we had earlier on uh, is I was informed when I went out that uh, consultants can change from one contract to another, just as a, ma a matter of fact, right? And I find it difficult to understand why we wouldn't have discussed with those consultants about the fact that we didn't want a two-tier system in the National Children's Hospital. Well, consultants can change at their request and at our decision. It's not the same as we can... Except we, don't have to, we don't have to employ them in the hospital if they don't want to play ball. Anyway, um, uh, the... Yeah, and then just, you know, on the question of... I mean, is it fair to say, then, that, you know, in the case of home care, which you mentioned, that because of the necessity to, as, as you see it, or as government sees it, to live within the budget, and that you're going to do more to live within the budget this year than you did last year, that people who need home care packages and have been approved for home care packages are not going to get them because of the imperative to work even more stringently within the budget. Isn't that well, the truth of it? So it's not going to be driven by medical need, basically. The, well, the allocation of home care packages. There was reference earlier to you know, budgets being, or targets being imposed on people. So unless we get to the stage where individual services can decide their own budget, ultimately there's a level of, you know, there is a level of resource sitting in the budgetary oversight committee. I'm assuming it's not seen as a negative thing to try to live within the resource. The issue is making best use of the resource you have and trying to say, well, given the, the demand that's, that's facing us, are we trying to prioritise and give that resource towards those patients, those families, those service users, in, in, as best we can. The answer to that is that's what we seek to do, but could we usefully and would we like to spend more on home support than we have this year? Absolutely yes. Has there been substantial investment, about 150 million extra in the last three or four years in home support? Yes. Would more be appropriate of good value to the economy? Yes. But fundamentally, we're faced with, we have a budget of 450 million, which is close to half a billion for home support. Uh, it's to support about 53,000 people. But just, if I can just, if I can just refine the question a little bit, okay? You surely know, when they give you your allocation for 2020 or for any year, that that allocation is not going to be sufficient to give a home care package to everybody who will be approved for a home care package. Surely you know that when the allocation is made. And do you not say, well, listen, that's the allocation you're giving us, but we can tell you now that's not going to be sufficient to meet the demand for home care packages that will be approved. And therefore, if you want everybody who needs a home care package to get one, you're going to have to allocate more. And definitely, so the simple answer is yes, probably there. So is there an extensive process, I think we set it out in the briefing, that says at the start of the process, what is the cost of keeping the existing level of service uh, going? What is the cost of additional demographic pressure? And then what is the kind of the developments that you'd like to put in place to go beyond just meeting the current need, uh, providing the current volume, making sure through demographics that, you know, the, the difficulty of one individual trying to get into that pool of service doesn't get any worse year on year? 
there's always the question of the people who are on waiting lists or the people who aren't even on waiting lists, you know, the pent up or latent demand that's out there. So do we know what it would cost or how much you could usefully invest in, in home support? We do. Do we share that in, on an annual basis with colleagues in the department? We do. But fundamentally we get to the position where, in fairness, the state has a certain amount of total resource. Uh, the state allocates a total resource and we have to operate within that. And in fairness to the state, if we look and say, well, we're putting 16 point something billion well, in there, can you not make it more but efficient? But ba based on those sort of, you know, estimates of demographic changes, demands, maintaining services and so on and so forth, do you not know at the very beginning of the year that there's going to be a deficit at the end of the year? Well, see, there's, there's two different things there, Deputy. One is, do we not know that we could usefully spend more in a particular area, or there's more demand there, or if we were providing? But the you service, do, but you do, but you yeah. actually do spend more. That's what the deficit, isn't it? So you there, spend more. There than are it. some areas where you can't, or it's very difficult to control costs, uh, particularly 24/7 services. That's the most difficult. In areas, unfortunately, like home support, you can live with an overall budget. We may not like the consequences of it, but we have 445 million. That's what we're seeking to spend, and we're seeking to get the best value out of that. Could you spend an extra 10, 50, 100 million more? You absolutely could. Now, you would like to spend that. Is there sufficient uh, staff that we could gear up to you know, put into home support? That's a, that's a separate question. So, um, so in some areas, absolutely, you can say um, more investment there would be useful. Part of the reason we're trying to live within the budget is to get the external credibility with our funders and the trust and confidence so that they'll be happy to invest more. But as I said, in home support, there's 150 million more in home support than there was three or four years ago. So that's not insubstantial. But is it, is it, would we use more? We absolutely would. Okay. Thank you very much, Deputy Boyd Barish. Uh, Deputy Louisa. Okay. That's okay. That's no, perfectly. Sorry, sorry. Deputy O'Reilly. That's fine. It's okay. I, I... <laughs> I'll ask a few questions, though. <laughs> um, and, Chair, I'll keep an eye on the time. Apologies for the last time. Um, the, okay, so we're here to discuss the budget. Um, you'll know this is one of my wee hobby horses, so no surprises. Uh, directly employed home helps versus agency. Um, even the Minister for Health has agreed with me. D directly employed home helps, and home helps that work for not-for-profit agents represent significantly better value for money. Is there any attempt being made, and I'll couple this with a, another question, which is to do with the uh, increasing spend on expensive agency staff. Is there any attempt being made to convert, and I mean by the setting of targets, because I know and you know that uh, at local level, managers want directly employed staff, but we are increasingly hearing from constituents that they are finding it difficult slash impossible to get offered permanent contracts. There are permanent vacancies, there are permanent jobs there, there is work that needs to be done. And it strikes me as a bit uh, counterintuitive to be spending money on agency when there are people there who want to work. So recently we've seen um, via social media, but also by, by contact directly with my own office, people who have left jobs abroad, qualified healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, who have left jobs abroad on the promise of a job here, have come here and then have not been able to get work. The contract that they were offered, or the job that they were offered, the delay in process and that. And so they're worried. I mean, they have to eat no more than the rest of us, pay their rent, do all of that stuff. So they're working, but they're working for agency. Now, they're making more money working for agency when they would have accepted a lower rate. Surely, it, you there's no logic to keeping these people as agency staff when they are willing to work as directly employed staff. And all that's going to happen is they're going to get themselves established on a higher rate of pay. And you know, no more than any of us, that if, you, if, you, if your your expenditure would expand to meet the uh, to meet the level of your income, uh, and it just strikes me as counterintuitive. And I've asked this question several times, and I've never been able to get an answer. Do you have targets, even if those targets are missed? Because I mean, look, you don't hit all your targets. We know that. Even if those targets are missed, is anyone setting targets for the conversion of agency and over time into directly employed staff? Yes. Definitely. What are they? 
So in the savings measures that we have for this year, mm -hmm. um, specifically in the service plans on phase about 82, if I remember the figure for agency, a combination of conversion and do without is about a 17 million target. Um, so, and actually, hospital groups and CHOs have come back and said they're going to try and target more than that. Now, people have said that in the past and it can be difficult to do. So, um, our WT controls that are in place now, even though they don't allow people to replace, they do encourage people to come forward to their national director with kind of well thought through plans to actually convert agencies. So, just to put it on the record, while 94% of our pay costs are not agency, mm -hmm. they're directly employed, um, we have no interest in maintaining people on agency. It doesn't suit the health service. It has a use for you know filling the odd short term, short -term temporary vacancies. Yeah. There. It doesn't suit filling kind of standard slots and rosters. Um, you don't get the continuity generally or often mm -hmm. that you would get with directly employed. Um, and in some cases, particularly um, along the west, where it's medical, um, we can't. Uh, we we end up paying even higher than our contracts because the market is such mm -hmm. that we're we're at risk from. You know, a small number of people have the qualifications and therefore they, they, they charge much higher rates. So it is not uh, our policy or our interest to keep people on agency. We okay. would like to see that reduced and we have some areas where we have unsustainable levels of agency, not just financially, but in terms of, you know, is, that, is, that, is that what you want in terms of quality service? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. Uh, so we, you, you, you've set the targets. And then we see in the correspondence that there's reports, and, and maybe they might be here with us today. But do you report on how those targets are being achieved? Yeah, we, we report a number of ways, Deputy. So we are reporting on people who've said they'll do savings on agency and how they're doing against those savings targets. Okay. We're also reporting on what's the overall level of agency and overtime. And in fairness, a number of our um, either CHOs or hospital groups have had, you know, their recent months have been either the lowest or second lowest mm -hmm. in agency and overtime in the last five, six, seven months. So we are kind of monitoring it. Okay, um, where can I get those reports? Uh, if you ask, we can provide them. Okay, I'm asking. <laughs> you can send them to me, thanks. Um, and with regard then to home helps, you, you, you'll know so this is a cause that, that, very to close to my heart, yeah. uh, Mr. So Mulvaney. What was the question then on the home helps? Uh, the, uh, Directly employed and not-for-profits um, represent significantly better value for money, and yet we see an increasing amount going into the corporate private sector where the hourly cost is more than uh, than for directly employed. I wasn't aware that there's such a difference to the favour of the directly employed versus the uh, the for-profit, if you want to call it, or, or private. Uh, it'll depend on the let's say, the mix of hours that they're covering. So obviously, daytime hours Monday to Friday versus evenings or weekends, mm -hmm. you get different costs. So as you know, across both our public, voluntary and private services, if you take nursing homes, for example, um, it's not always as straightforward as saying that the, certainly in simple unit costs, that the public is cheaper. The broader definition of value for money might, might make a difference to that. So I'd have to check. I, I don't have information that tells me that uniformly the private costs per hour of home support is higher than the public. Well, according to PQ voluntary. responses I have, it, it, it is coming in as higher. But it, let's, say, let's say it is, let's say I'm right, and uh, it is higher. Would you not think it would make more sense then to reorient the service towards directly employed and not-for-profits and away from uh, the most expensive forms? The same as with agency. You know, I don't understand you do it when you have to, but it's, it, yeah. there's a difference no, no, between becoming reliant on it. If it was more expensive, it. you would. Obviously, there's more than just cost, there's the value and the overall quality mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. Um, there is a market there now for, for home help and home support. Um, when we got substantial additional investment in home support, not all the areas were able to actually expand into that through either directly employed or um, voluntary at the time. So we now have a market, we now have a requirement to go to tender. and. Um, you know, part of the market will be driven by private, or at least driven by competition. Mm -hmm. uh, the the not-for-profits are competing with the privates as well for the uh, home support market. But I agree, a balance is, is where you want to get to. Yeah, well, the balance is going all out of kilter. Just one last question on, in relation to the capital plan, and I know this has been asked already, but it, you'll understand that it, 
it kind of stretches credibility a bit that at this point in the proceedings there's not a capital plan and yet we know that capital projects are going to proceed. How is that up? Who is deciding the absence of a plan? Who is making those decisions? How, how are you operating? And would you not accept that there is a difficulty that the capital plan hasn't been published? And there's also a perception, by the way, that a capital plan exists somewhere, but it just hasn't been published. Um, I think definitely, as my colleague, if you can comment, but, so there is a draft plan mm -hmm. that the HSE has um, submitted to the department. Mm -hmm. We are working to, particularly the already contractually committed elements of that draft plan, they represent 75% of the money we have anyway. So it's not that we're not working to something and there isn't clarity between the, the department and the HSE as to what we're working to. The, 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 the real difference in getting to the preferred position of having a signed off and approved final capital plan is the pieces around that balance of 25% and what can move at what pace, that's where that will obviously be an assistance. But I mean, we are spending capital money. We will spend the full allocation, or practically the full allocation, but not over on capital this year, and it will be spent on projects that provide value. Um, so that's not being uh, prevented by where we are. Now, the summary economic statement assisted certainly with the arithmetic mm -hmm. around the overall decisions. Uh, this quite extensively already. No, no, I, Deputy, I, I you, you, have about, you have about half a minute there. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, no, just one, uh, one final question, and it relates to, the again, just to go back to the agency and the directly employed. And I fully understand this is a budget meeting, but where there are issues regarding people not offered permanent contracts where permanent jobs exist, and where there is a case where agency has been converted into directly employed staff, do they then break the ceiling that is in place. So if you have somebody on agency versus somebody, so they, they would say, make it simple, say they cost 15 quid an hour on agency and a tenor on uh, a tenor an hour directly employed and you convert two of them. Can you then say, well, now I have a tenor surplus and I'm going to convert another one and bring another person in then? Or is it a case that that conversion can only happen within the ceiling? Because there's no benefit really to converting if that if that money doesn't get recycled back and turned into actual personnel. Don't forget, Deputy, some some of the conversion of agency is to try and close the financial gap and live within the budget. So first thing is it's not necessarily the two individuals who are coming in to work as agency. So let's say there's a hundred hours of agency. What we're saying is we're going to recruit two or two and a half people, preferably permanent people, but on direct payroll, to provide those 100 hours, they will make some saving, whatever whatever saving is. The intent of the say, the first call on the saving is to live within the overall pay budget. That's one of the reasons why we're doing it. Not to, you know, the capacity of health service to spend money is not in question. <laughs> We are sitting in the Budget Oversight Committee discussing how we're oh, going yeah. to close the gap. Yeah, no, no, no. That, appreciate that. that, appreciate that, that. I think we could all agree on. But there's, there's not a massive incentive then for local no. management to, to do that conversion outside of the, the money. But if they're they short of personnel. It means they don't have to talk to me. <laughs> Just take it out as <laughs> Thank you very much. I say nothing on that, Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deputy O'Reilly. Um, listen, can I bring it to a conclusion then by uh, thanking both Mr Desmond and Mr O'Reilly for coming in and engaging with us as the Budget Oversight Committee. Uh, we, we appreciate the engagement. We, um, we really do, because obviously some of the people don't turn up sometimes to our committee when uh, we request their presence. So we particularly welcome the fact that that you came and you engaged with us uh, uh, today. And with that, I am going to bring our committee uh, proceedings to a conclusion, and we are adjourned now, Sine Dine. Okay, thank you very much.